Good evening. The first time I was ever invited to a Hollywood party of the real kind, uh, it was uh, at the house of uh, the legendary agent Irving Lazar, and I said to somebody, are there any rules to remember when you go to a party of that kind? And the person said, yes, one, try to sit next to Billy Wilder. Uh, he is high on the list of people I have always wanted to have on my show, and he is my guest this evening. Uh, Billy Wilder, Mr. Wilder, uh, is one of Hollywood's great directors. His films include uh, such classics as Some Like It Hot, uh, The Seven Year Itch, Stalag 17, Near Maladeus, Lost Weekend, The Sunset Boulevard, many, many others. Um, his latest film is Buddy, Buddy, which uh, reunites him with Walter Matthau and with Jack Lemmon, uh, whom he first worked with in The Fortune Cookie in 1966, it was. And Mr. Wilder's incredibly long list of honors includes six Academy Awards and an amazing 20 Academy Award nominations. And if having directed these films and worked with great actresses from Garbo to Monroe isn't enough, Mr. Wilder has also lived a rich and extraordinarily interesting life. You could write 10 novels about him. He once actually interviewed Sigmund Freud, or partially. Perhaps we'll clear that up. Yeah, he lived in Berlin during the incredible 20s. He's befriended and collected the work of the finest artists of this century. Uh, besides all that, his wit and fast tongue are truly legendary. This may not be his favorite, but he once said <laughs> about France, it's a country where the money falls apart in your hand and you can't tear the toilet paper. Uh, so uh, will you welcome, please, then, Mr. Billy Wilder. Uh, I don't know if in your collected quotations that's your favorite, but uh, for me it would be hard to top. <laughs> uh, it's sort of partially forgettable. <laughs> okay. By the way, can I clear up something that's bothered me some? Uh, the idea of a, a small boy in Germany being called Billy seems a little incongruous, it, as it, if the scriptwriter made a mistake. That's true. Uh, my name, my second name is Wilder, which easily enough can be Americanized into Wilder. Mm -hmm. Uh, my mother had spent uh, like about 15 years as a very young girl in America. Came back to Europe, married, had uh, two sons. The one, uh, the older one was called Wilhelm, which would translate into William. That makes it even more complicated. So there was a... And uh, that's my brother's name. Yeah. W. Lee Wilder, he calls himself now. And uh, the, my name uh, was... Uh, in my birth certificate was Samuel Wilder, but my mother, being very American, she called one Willie and the other one Billy, and that's the way it was. <laughs> okay. And I didn't want to interfere with that. But, but I gather she, she liked America. She yes, uh, instilled she in you a desire to be there, did she? Or uh, just well, a... of course. Yeah. But uh, in those days, you know, when I was, uh, when I was young, the, the idea of going to America, I mean, that occurred to, that was the dream of everybody. Yeah. That was like going to the moon, you know. When mm -hmm. an American came to town, you know, you latched on to him. He was something very special. And it was just a wild dream to go to America. I mean, the whole thing changed uh, after World War II. Mm -hmm. Just like it's going to change five years from now, it's going to be very difficult to run into somebody who had not been to China. That's right. They're all going there all the time. Either they have been or they will go. Yeah. I'm unique among my friends. I've never been to China. I am too, but I'm finding more and more that I'm, I'm the only person in a room yes. of four people who hasn't yes. been to China. Yeah, I hope it's still there when we get there. Uh, would I be a different person now if I had gone through the Berlin of the 20s? It's always so frustrating when you read these books that say, oh, that was the time. There has never been anything like it. The decadence, the art, the, uh, the decadent art, the... Um, Oh, yeah. The wild people, the, the drugs, the entertainment, the fomenting literary movements, the various strange things that went on, the beauty of the city. Um, how, can, how can I stand not having been there? That's well, a hard go, question. Go and see, go and see, go and see uh, um, Cabaret, read Brecht, mm -hmm. uh, listen to Schoenberg music. Yes, you would. Uh, it, you, will get the, you will get the feeling, you know, look at some uh, uh, German uh, expressionist, uh, you will get the feeling, but indeed it was an uh, 
it was uh, something not to have missed. I'm delighted that I was there, I can tell mm -hmm. you. And that goes, I mean, I spent, uh, coming from Vienna, I, I went to Berlin in, uh, in the middle 20s and stayed there until uh, 33. I left uh, the day after the Reichstag fire. Yeah. I, I left uh, because uh, I was not uh, very welcome there, I felt. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have a German passport, so I could get out of there. Yeah. In, in, in 33, um, Hitler took over January 30th, and I left like uh, in April, I think it was. Mm -hmm. But those years before, <coughs> absolute total madness. Um, I don't know, there was something, Berlin always had that great thing for me, even today. I was in the American army when I, when I, when, 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 uh, when I went back to Berlin in 45. It's a very small part of the conquerors, an enormous feeling. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 it's in the air. There's something about, about, about uh, Berlin, about the Berliners, their humor, their uh, apparent stark uh, attitude toward everything, but yeah. rather correct, you know, so that there will be no misunderstandings. You know, Hitler was, uh, was Austrian, and yeah. he, his backing came primarily from Bavaria. The Prussians behaved... Uh, behaved not too badly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not here to, to, to ask forgiveness for them, but uh, I, I, I felt less uh, persecuted in, uh, in, in Berlin, as a matter of fact, never persecuted, than I felt in Vienna when I grew up uh, going to, to school there. Yes. Vienna, why does Austria have a credit for being more anti-Semitic than Germany for some reason? Uh, because they are. Oh. Because they were. That probably would <laughs> contribute to the yes. reputation. Because, <laughs> yeah. No, because, and they are not, they don't yeah. even come out straight, uh, kind of forward and say, well, yes, we were, we were mm -hmm. uh, uh, enthralled by the idea of one Germany and, uh, and uh, we joined. And uh, they will now, they will all tell you they have been raped. Mm -hmm. they, have been, uh, they have been subjugated by and against their will and they try to protect whoever the minorities. They're not at all, no. But uh, such is, uh, you know, they, they like to talk about Emperor Francis Joseph, but they don't like to talk about those years of the Anschluss when they, when they became a very uh, um, militant part of, uh, of the Bewegung, of the Nazi movement. Mm -hmm. I, I picture the Berlin of the 20s as um, uh, uh, exotic dancers nude dancing on tables at 3 a.m., in fact, I think that image comes from something I read about a famous... There was a, a woman, a young woman, who died eventually of heroin overdose, who was yeah. one of the first yeah. exotic dancers. Anita Berber. Yes, yes. There was that dance in Berber and Droster, I think, were the names. Well, it was sort of the, 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 the reaction after, after World War I. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, when people say about uh, drugs and uh, heroin and... Uh, Cocaine, my God, we had that all there. Yeah. You survived down. without becoming uh, becoming hooked on anything, apparently. Who me? You, you yes, you. you apparently well, I were couldn't afford it. Able to, <laughs> you know, to be uh, to uh, this since I since uh, there was very little mugging in those days, and uh -huh. uh, holding up uh, uh, pharmacies, it was a very expensive sport, you know. And I was kind of I was much too young for that. I much guess. too young, yes. Thank, thank, thank you. Very nice answer. Uh, you know what's a, a mystery even today among sociologists and people who write uh, le learned essays and so on is why did some Jews know to get out of Germany and others didn't even when the people next door to them were hauled away? They just could not believe for the longest time, in many cases for too long a time, until it was too late, that a thing like this can happen in the uh, in the country of uh, Goethe and Beethoven. They just could not believe that mm -hmm. it was possible. Now, you must understand, you know, that the, 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 the German Jews have been the most patriotic of the Germans, much more patriotic than the Germans themselves. There were more heroes in World War I who were Jewish, mm -hmm. percentage-wise, naturally, you know, an unbelievable number, and they were, they were just uh, assimilating themselves as quickly as they, as they could. They did not like the Eastern Jews very much. They didn't think of living any place else but. Mm -hmm. Now, the peculiar thing, for instance, which will give you a little insight, 
the great hero of uh, uh, in German mythology is, uh, if you've seen the Nibelungen, the Ring, the, the Reinhard, the, 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 the Richard Wagner thing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, was uh, Siegfried, the great hero who uh, killed the dragon, Slayed you know, the, dragon. The, whole, the whole thing, you know. Yeah. You saw that, you know, by the hours, you know, in the, in the Wagnerian operas. And uh, in order to prove how German they were, they called their sons Siegfried. And it has since become a totally Jewish name. Anybody called Siegfried is Jewish. It was kind of named after the greatest hero in German mythology, uh, and uh, it sort of uh, stamped them as. Uh, mm -hmm. But they, they, just, uh, they just did not, they could not uh, grasp it. I, of course, ran as fast and as far as possible. Some of my friends, writers, newspaper men, they went to, um, to Vienna, because that was before the Anschluss, before the mm -hmm. Germans marched. And they went to Prague. They were, the, the one, the one uh, uh, tool they had was their language. Mm -hmm. They did not, it was a very, very risky thing to do for a writer. And I was a writer. In, in those days, I was a newspaper man. I wrote, I wrote screenplays. Uh, you know, to, to move to a foreign country and be deprived of the language. You know, this, is, uh, this is a tragic circumstance. But you also said something I hadn't thought of, which is they could say, surely they won't do anything to us. Or your father and your grandfather fought for this country and we live yeah, here. Yeah, they, they, they paraded with, with yeah. medals from yeah. nothing. Nothing helped them, believe mm -hmm. me, absolutely nothing. And yet but you lost relatives, didn't you? And yes, sir, my, my mother and my grandmother and my stepfather, they died in Auschwitz, yes. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in 1943. That time I lived in America, there was just nothing one could do. Yeah. Have you ever had any desire to go to Auschwitz? Uh, as a I have been to Auschwitz. I have been to, to, to Dachau mm -hmm. um, in 45. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, a very touching, but uh, yeah. it's very strange, you know, how yeah, people yeah. react to that thing. Like a friend of mine told me that uh, uh, he went to see, he went to see uh, the diary of Anne Frank, mm -hmm. the play. And uh, he went with a young man, not necessarily German. He was European, I think, or maybe American, I forget. And, and after the play, he said, well, would you believe that things like this could happen? And the guy just looked at him and says, well, let's, let's hear the other side. To the other side? Yeah. Mm. This, is, this is kind of just a, 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 a one man's perspective. Uh -huh. thing. Now let's be, you know, uh, let's not uh, uh, rush to a judgment mm -hmm. how quickly it is forgotten. Wow. Let's be fair to Hitler, in other words. Well, no, let's be fair to the truth. <laughs> Nobody is unless... And, no, that, that yeah. we just had that... Uh, having that lawsuit, which they lost now, mm -hmm. of that professor somewhere in Orange County who... Uh, claimed it never just, happened? Yeah, claimed that the whole thing is... Uh, it was staged by, by some people in Hollywood. They got uh, themselves some very hungry extras mm -hmm. uh, uh, who had to play dead, or you showed their ribs. And, but uh, the whole yeah. thing, you know, it was staged, the, 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 the ovens, uh, incredible. It is amazing. A professor yet. Yeah. Well, as we all know, there are some professors who would be better off yeah. elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> was Marlene Dietrich uh, one of the young figures of the 20s Berlin? Yes. Yeah. Marlene, you ever, could you see then that this woman has star quality? No, I couldn't. Mm. I couldn't. I, <laughs> she, do, you know, she does, she does yeah. have star quality. Can you now? <laughs> yes, indeed. Oh, yes, okay. absolutely indeed. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> look, it's, 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 uh, mm. she is, uh, she is, uh, kind of a, an elementary thing, you know, in, in thinking about uh, absolutely. But uh, in those days, you know, she was, uh, she was uh, a, a little actress who played smaller parts. Mm -hmm. uh, Sternberg came to Berlin to shoot uh, The Blue Angel. Yeah. Originally, he wanted to do a whole different uh, story, a different uh, script. But then they settled on Heinrich Mann's Pro Professor Unrat, which became The Blue Angel. And uh, he saw her, he saw something in her, and he made her. Yeah. It is a whole different Marlene now than the one that we knew in the coffee houses and restaurants uh, and, or the stages in Berlin.
And without him, she would probably not have been. Uh, it, it needed it needed uh, uh, that uh, that thing. That's the way it happens. You know? mm -hmm. Like uh, uh, Louis B. May, I understand, went to to Europe and hired a, a Swedish director uh, by the name of uh, I think Sistren was his name. I would have to check up on that. But however, the director said, "Look, I I cannot uh, uh, go to uh, uh, to Hollywood uh, without." Uh, a young actress who's a friend of mine uh, coming with me. I would mm -hmm. be very lonely, I just couldn't do it. So in order to get that great director, Louis V. May says, oh, the hell with it, bring her along. And that was Garbo. Now the director's forgotten, but that was, the, that was Garbo. Mm -hmm. But uh, Marlene, and a very brave woman indeed, believe me, a very, very brave woman. I think that uh, being the daughter of a Prussian general, she behaved incredibly correctly. Just she was uh, she was uh, uh, she was uh, a, a, a very very uh, moral uh, uh, strong uh, uh, thing that that uh, that that we should be very proud of. And I saw her during the war. You know, she was mm -hmm. uh, she was entertaining troops. You know, in forty four, forty five, yes. and for years she didn't want to go back to Germany. She is uh, quite something. Yes, so you admire Gar you admire her uh, very much, more, th more very, ways very than much. more yes. ways than one. Uh, about Garbo, here's something I've heard two versions of. One is that if you walked on the set and watched her shooting a film, you would be stunned. Yeah. And other people have said uh, it looks like she isn't doing anything. And then you see the film printed the next day, and there's this magical sure. thing happening, and you couldn't see it there, but she knew in some instinctual way. Is the truth uh, somewhere in between, or well, what was uh, your experience? With well, you? first let me correct the thing, because I cannot take credit. You said I directed among all the people, male stars, female stars. Uh, I, 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 I never directed, I never directed uh, 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 Garbo. I, I was one of the writers on Ninochka. On Ninochka, yeah. And one day I came on the set, Lubitsch was directing it, and uh, she was a very private person. She sensed that there was a stranger on the set. And uh, mm. she just whispered something to somebody. And as I was standing and watching the scene, suddenly four guys came up and put up a blackboard between me and the scene that was going on. <laughs> she just didn't want to be watched. Uh -huh. But there's something very, very magic about, about uh, that, that, that curious element X, you know, that uh, if we knew what it was, if we could... Uh, uh, patent it, uh, patent uh, it. If he could, uh, if he could uh, uh, reproduce it, we would have many garbos and uh, sure. and uh, and many uh, 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 stars, many Streisands, uh, uh, many Crawfords, many Shirley Shirley Temple. It's been tried and tried, you know. Mm -hmm. Same hairdo, prettier, dances better, but it's just not not Shirley Temple, you know. They, they brought all of those kids on. You remember yeah. those, those, those waves. That, it is it's something that you could not, could mm -hmm. not foresee how it works on the screen. Now, yeah. Gary Cooper, for instance, was another one like this. You know, you watched him play a scene yeah. and he did nothing. But then you watched the rushes next day and there was that tremendous thing coming mm -hmm. off. A whole different thing than what you saw with your naked eye. Is there anything you can learn from that? Like the best rule is to underact on the screen, or or anything, or is it simply that certain personalities have it? Yeah, it's it's kind of that magnetic thing, you know, something that that grabs the audience's interest, mm -hmm. that sort of uh, where you have to watch with great fascination, where you just can't help yourself. You don't want to take your eyes off that person, mm -hmm. and uh, you're born with that thing. Did you find that Garbo had that same quality in person? You've met her, I know. Do yes, you, I, 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 met her, I met her quite a few times. Mm. Uh, well, no, but you see, by this time, you know, you, you superimpose, you know it's Garbo, oh, so it's yeah, very sure. difficult. You know, it says, who is that? You know, you know it's Garbo, so you already look at her differently. <laughs> yeah. I just wonder if a stranger meeting her would be overwhelmed by that same thing, or does no. it have to take, it requires the no, camera No, not the unless she walked down Fifth Avenue mm. and she's walking there in mm. a big, uh, large-brimmed, hat with the veil because she doesn't want to be recognized mm -hmm. and eight people are running after her and then you just look says, what's that? You says, that's Garbo. And you join those people and you run after yeah. her. Would you have wanted to have a love affair with her if you could? Garbo? Yeah. What a fantastic idea. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm no, sorry, I, I don't know. I, I, I would not, but I tell you something very peculiar. Not the, 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 the great stars are uh, the truly great female stars are the ones uh, that are both uh, 
uh, admired, uh, desired by the male and the female uh, part of the audience. By mm -hmm. that I mean, if uh, my wife found out that I had an affair with Garbo or with Monroe, whom she loved, yeah. she would be rather proud of her husband. <laughs> However, if she, if, she, if she heard that I had an affair with a, a I'm not going to mention names, but kind of in the bimbo class of girls, <laughs> she, would, she, would, she would never forgive me. Yes. She would be very proud. She would go, she would go to the hairdresser and would say, hey, hey, my husband slept with garble. Isn't that terrific? Yeah. Be very proud. Sure. If not, take an ad in Daily Variety or something. So, I mean, Here's that yeah. story, you know, with that, that couple. They just got married, you know, and... And uh, they come out of the church, and, uh, and he turns to the wife and says, uh, Honey, darling, sweetheart, I swear I will never, never, never cheat uh, on you with anybody. Maybe, maybe, maybe with Garbo. And the wife says, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, it's a third it, section. It's just something, it says something, something about it, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's wonderful. I, I, and I think your wife is an extraordinarily admirable woman. No, it's just, it's, it's, it is, it is kind I guess of, the point beyond, is that she is beyond sex, you know, it's kind yeah. of, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's uh, partaking of a myth. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I said at the beginning, and I realize it was partially accurate, that you interviewed Sigmund Freud. Now, the fact that I can be sitting next to a man who was this close to Sigmund Freud well, seems almost as strange to me as if you said you had interviewed General Custer uh, or Columbus. Um, Not at all, Because no. he it, it seems like such no. a mythic figure who may he, he or is. maybe existed in an opera rather than in real life. Yeah, but uh, remember, that was 1925, you know? Yeah. That was before the, uh, the thing, the Freudian thing uh, mm -hmm. kind of jumped across the borders, you know? This was, uh, in those days, I didn't know anybody who had been analyzed. But I was a very young newspaper man in, 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 uh, in uh, Vienna, those days, and uh, we were doing, I will make the story as short as possible, we were oh. doing a, 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 for the Christmas number, as they did every year, they would have one topical question. And yes. then they would send the young reporters out to interview people to get their uh, attitude toward that question mm -hmm. and answer to that. I remember the question. The question was, what do you think of... Uh, uh, of that newfangled political movement called fascism and the man uh, of the hour in Italy, Mussolini. That was the question. It's a nice Christmas question. Yeah, it's a nice Christmas yeah. question, but uh, uh, it was, was not all that serious in those days. Little fascism, you know, was kind of, was a brand new kind of, a, just like psychoanalysis. That's right, a lot of history Wait. hadn't taken place. Absolutely. So I, I, I went uh, mm -hmm. within a period of a day or two days by streetcar, believe me, not to think, you know, where reporters had automobiles and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The owner of the paper had the, the automobile, but uh, no, we went by Slika. And I saw within a day or two, I forget, I saw Schnitzler, I saw Richard Strauss, I saw a fellow analyst, uh, Adler, and I also saw Professor Freud. <laughs> Incredible now, list. this is just, yeah, this is kind of, you, can, uh, yeah, you right. can live a whole life wanting to meet those people, but it didn't mean that much to me in yeah. those days. So now I... Uh, I, uh, I went to, to see Freud, it was lunchtime. And uh, as all doctors in Middle Europe are, also in London and in Paris some, they function out of their apartments. The living room is the waiting room. Mm -hmm. uh, the study is, uh, you know, they don't have offices, or they didn't have, I don't know, maybe they have now. He, uh, he had an apartment on the Berggasse 19 in the ninth district, arrondissement in Vienna. Mm -hmm. And I went there, kind of, very innocently. I kind of walked up the steps there, on the second or third floor, I rang the doorbell, and uh, the maid uh, answered. I gave her my visiting card, and I said, uh, Herr Wilder, I'm from the newspaper, Die Stunde was the name of the paper, I, I would like to see uh, Professor Freud. She just come in, and she led me into the salon, which was also the waiting room, and uh, I knew I could smell that there was a terrific lunch going on someplace there in the department. And I was waiting, and uh, I looked, and there was a door ajar, and I threw that crack in the door. I could see the couch. It was a tiny little couch 
with the little Turkish carpet kind of tiny. It must have been uh, uh, must have been specialized. Uh, must have been specializing analyzing uh, uh, midgets or children. I don't know, tiny. It's never been, <laughs> this is uh, early yeah. stages. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just kind of reading. It. I knew vaguely about Freud. I didn't know too much about him. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly a door opened and Freud came in. Small man himself, beard. He had his napkin tucked under his shirt, you know, very European, you know, kind of mm -hmm. like you read it in novels of Thomas Mann or, or Balzac, for that matter, you know. This is the bourgeois family. Mm -hmm. And he had the visiting card in his hand. And he said, uh, Herr Wilder, and I said, Jawohl, Herr Professor. And he says, Dort ist die Tür, there is the door. And I made a short little bow and I walked out. And that was it. There is the door. He threw me out. <laughs> now, on, uh, on, uh, hmm. in retrospect, I think it is much more honorable to be thrown out by Freud than be given a state dinner by Colonel Gaddafi. You, you agree with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you have your choice. Oh, yeah, if you have the choice, always. Yeah. Or if you have dinner with Gaddafi, keep your eye on the door. I would... So Freud gave you the heave-ho. He gave me the heave-ho, and, uh, and uh, he That's hated good. newspaper uh, uh -huh. I mean, anyway. Uh, they were poking slight fun at him, uh, and uh, he just didn't like any, any, they misquoted him. And it was one of those uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of, uh, he never talked to newspaper men, yeah. as I found out subsequently. They just, they knew when they sent me, oh boy, is he going to get it? Chance. And I got it. <laughs> That's quite an abrupt heave-ho, though. I wonder if he felt guilty afterwards and uh, had to talk to Adler about it. Oh, Adler, Adler, I've never... That, that 16 pages of answer. A mm -hmm. drivel master. He was just going all over the place. Oh. <laughs> a drivel master? Yeah, well, kind of driveling on and on and on. Yeah. You know, but, uh, of course, um, nobody points to me and says, hey, there's a man who had an interview with Adler. Tomorrow night, Billy Wilder will delight us all again as he crosses the Atlantic, goes directly to Hollywood, and reminisces about Swanson, Monroe, Bogey, Bacall, the greatly missed Claude Rains, and much else that is fun and fascinating to hear. Join us. Tonight we continue this rare opportunity to capture the wit and charm of Billy Wilder on television, and we will start right up with the subject of famous roles. There are always stories about famous movies which we can only think of one way. I mean, you only think of Betty Davis uh, in, in uh, All About Eve, and yet you hear that someone else was offered the part. In fact, I think Claudette Colbert. That's right. Um, Colbert was offered the part, that's right. And I can only think of Sunset Boulevard, of course, as Gloria Swanson, and yet she was not the first choice, I, I learned. Well, she, she, she was, in a sense, the second choice. When uh, we, we were talking very vaguely about the concept of the picture, but as we mapped it out in more detail, mm -hmm. as it fell into a first, second, and third act, and the scenes got to be written, uh, the original concept, which was uh, Mae West, I think, and then uh, subsequently it was between three former uh, big stars, yeah. mm, Mary Pickford, then Paula Negri, and then Swanson, it then kind of, uh, I made a test with Swanson, it was clearly Swanson. But, uh, you know, the, the remarkable thing about it is, I was just thinking uh, about it the other day, that uh, mm, as you think back, and please don't, uh, uh, to the picture, you know, because I never look at my old pictures, but yeah. uh, people do talk about that picture. It was about an old washed out star mm -hmm. uh, with the sound coming in and she being a silent picture actress is finished and covered. Now, very few people realize that Swanson was but 50 years old when she played that part. She's 82 now, and, and the picture was done, made 32 years ago. In other words, Swanson, when she made that picture, was younger than, say, for instance, Audrey Hepburn is today. Isn't that astonishing? That, is a, that, guy, that yeah. takes me a moment to yeah. get my mind she was, around. She was but 50. Yeah. <clears throat> but we had that big chasm that worked for us, namely the transition from silent pictures, the people that fell by the wayside, mm -hmm. and, to, and to, to, when, when the sound came in. It's also ironic that she tested for it. Um, I suppose everyone has thought of the joke, if she hadn't gotten the part, would you have told her you only wanted her car? But uh, Yeah, there is a part of, that, there's uh, a little bit of that in the picture strange, itself, too. It? Yeah. Yeah. There is a sort of Raskini car. Uh -huh. And the pleasure she was to work with, just marvelous. I loved working with her.
Who are some of the worst people to work with? <laughs> W w uh, you know, I, I'd like to tell you just one thing, you know, that, uh, that uh, uh, I have uh, very much like uh, some of our presidents, I have a penchant, you know, every time I open my mouth, I put my foot in it. <laughs> so I better be very careful, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I rather not, uh, not tell you the worst people. Uh, I can understand that. Uh, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult because the moment may come where I need them desperately. You say, oh, you said something... Uh, uh, nasty about me on that cabbage show, so just get lost. No, there are no. There are some more temperamental people, yeah. some more difficult people, some more complex people, some easy people. They're mm -hmm. all very different. You know, this is like a, a, a doctor dealing with patients. It's not one patient is different from the other one. They all kind of have their own personality. Surely the ones with uh, with the talent, uh, uh, the stars. You know, they are all mm -hmm. totally different. They have to be treated differently. I read something you said once that um, uh, someone was saying, how could you work with someone terribly temperamental? And you said, my grandmother could be on time and know her lines and be ready when we're ready to start, but she wouldn't necessarily be Marilyn Monroe, I think it was. In it fact. was Monroe, yes. Uh, and uh, in other words, that you, uh, somewhere there's the line, to the talented, much will be forgiven. Um, well, when it's, when it's all over and, and when it works, you know, it's... Uh, you're not sore at the dentist after your, after your teeth are all shiny and fixed and everything is just marvelous, no? You don't want to strangle him right. while, you're, while he's uh, drilling in your tooth, you know, you're suffering. Mm -hmm. But when it's all over, you walk down the, down the elevator, I mean, you go down the elevator, walk down the street, you whistle, you're happy. So that's uh, the result. It's the only thing that really matters. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, angry as uh, I got with uh, Monroe and a few other... Uh, female and male stars, you know, if the results uh, uh, warrant the, the trouble you had, mm -hmm. it, it's all forgotten after that. But then again, I worked yeah. with some very pleasant people. The whole thing was just uh, an absolute delight. It was a sleigh ride, but the picture stunk, and I, I, whenever I think of them, you know, I get so angry. That, God damn it. <laughs> you know how it is. You know, Maybe if they'd been more temperamental. Yeah, because you kind of, you, you superimpose on that thing. You know, mm -hmm. there's a there is a, uh, a very famous story of a Goldwyn story, and this is a true one, you know, where um, mm, he asked a writer, I think the name of the writer was Eddie Shadaroff, very good uh, uh, screenwriter some years back. And uh, Goldwyn asked him to write a script. He says, I, I uh, had 10 writers work on that thing. Nobody can solve it, maybe you can. And he read the 10 scripts and went to Goldman and said, Mr. Goldman, abandon that picture. I read all of the script, and I was thinking about myself. If there's no solution, you're just going to, believe me, you're just going to lose all your money. It's going to be a total flop. And uh, Goldman did not listen, got another right, another right, and finally made the picture. And the picture was a total flop. And uh, he's now preparing another picture, and an agent suggests... Mr. Shadrov. He says, Shadrov, that son of a bitch, he reminds me of my worst picture I've ever made. <laughs> he warned him not to do it. But that was the, the kind of thought connection. I see. There's still a fascination with Marilyn Monroe. Um, as we sit here now, there was just still another television movie about her. And uh, not bad from what I saw without, uh, of course, I never knew the woman. Um, are, are there sides of her that haven't been finally exposed publicly? Is there... What am I trying to say? Can, could you see what her tragedy was when you knew her that, in ways that <clears throat> haven't been perceived or told? Well, let me, as I mentioned before, putting my the foot in my mouth, uh, I lived through a kind of a horrifying moment. I was flying from uh, New York to Paris to make a picture there. And I arrived in Paris, it was on a Sunday, I think. I arrived in Paris, and there were like six or eight newspaper men there. And uh, they all jumped on me. Uh, Tell us about Monroe. I was rather surprised, you know. I, I don't like, I didn't like to talk about Monroe, but uh, and six or maybe one or two newspaper men when Wilder arrives in Paris, no such yeah. big thing. And. Uh, on the way to the hotel, I turned to my collaborator, Ariel Diamond, and I said, what was all that questioning about? And I kind of really let go. 
until I see the land transition, the Paris Press, the, the afternoon papers, while I was flying, she had committed suicide. That's why they asked me those questions without telling me that she had committed suicide. I got right. caught there, you know, so I just, I would certainly not have answered those questions, or certainly not mm. that way, if you know what I mean. You mean they had said, let's not tell him, he may not know, yeah, do you think, conspired to... I don't know whether, really. they did not tell me. They just started asking questions about Monroe, and I just answered, not knowing wow. that that poor girl was dead. Ooh. So, uh, she was a very complex, uh, yeah. uh, very unhappy person, mm. with marvelous moments, with a great gift uh, for comedy, she, without uh, too much training, and that's even before uh, she went to that Strasbourg uh, university, uh, 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 she, she, she knew where the joke was, you know, she, 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 read, the, she read the lines just magically. And of course yeah. there was that, that, that great innocence with, uh, with uh, uh, just totally unaware of the bazooms and the behind and the figure and the lushness of the whole thing. Uh, there was something mm -hmm. very sweet about her. She could also be uh, very mean. She could be very mean to assistant directors. Mm -hmm. She could be, uh, no sense of time, very late always. Sometimes uh, uh, kind of a, a line would block her, uh, her, her retention uh, she would be unable to get past a line, you know. Mm -hmm. You needed all the uh, all the patience you you could have, but uh, you would you could not recast. I mean, there's no such thing has happened since uh, since uh, since Monroe. And I don't think uh, it will happen very soon. Is the miracle that somebody like that perishes the way she did, or is the miracle that more people don't in Hollywood? Well, she was, she was a special case, you know, yeah. but it is extremely difficult for, for stars of that magnitude uh, to get to find the great third act. In fact, she did have a third act. Mm -hmm. uh, Carol Lombard had a great, I mean, it, it was a tragic third act, but mm -hmm. there was some kind of a, of a, of a curtain. Mm -hmm. I know other big stars, you know, they married uh, uh, air, um, airline pilots and have retired to, uh, to uh, uh, Texas, uh, have married very rich, have disappeared, but what do you do? I mean, where is that, where is that uh, uh, mm -hmm. Goethe Demerung? Where? How does that happen? Very, very difficult. Yeah. And when I see those great, great uh, beauties, the great stars, Sometimes they, they still show up in small parts mm -hmm. uh, in the tele, on television or in movies. And I say, my God, that was blah, blah. Just, I don't believe it. She suddenly weighs 109. I, I, I don't, didn't want her to play that. I wanted to remember her the way she was. Yeah. There is a, it's, it's very, very difficult, you know. It's easier maybe for the male star. Mm -hmm. Than for the females. Probably for, for a woman to get that high and yeah, to get down difficult. gracefully is uh, very difficult. I think really, that uh, yeah. uh, Betty Davis is doing a, mm -hmm. a super job. You know, she is um, mm -hmm. very yeah. professional and she just finds yeah. the right part and she just kind of bullies through. She just does not uh, retire. But uh, uh, the beauties, the great beauties, you know, it's just mm -hmm. it's a tragedy. What about? It's, it's fun to pick your brains about these legendary personalities. Uh, pardon the uh, cliche. Uh, you're supposed to have had some problems with Bogart and working with him. Was he Bogart, troublesome? yeah. Bogart was tough, too. Yeah. I, I did not become a uh, intimate friend of Bogart's. And uh, only then, when I became uh, an intimate friend of his, mm -hmm. did I see that uh, this guy was indeed a man of tremendous courage and guts, and that was when he was dying. Yeah. Uh, uh, he he did not want to play the part. He, we we did a picture together with uh, uh, Audrey Hepburn and Bill Holden and uh, and Bogart. We did Sabrina. Sabrina. Yeah. And he did not quite want to play that part. But since I'd worked with with uh, with uh, uh, with Bogart, I'm rather with Holden and with uh, with Hepburn before, mm -hmm. he thought that I was siding with them. That uh, we had drinks after, 
uh, uh, after the shooting and we excluded him that uh, we had a little clique and uh, he was just not a very friendly guy in those days. Uh, he would kind of... Uh, hard to imagine him insecure though. And you can't imagine. It's hard to imagine that he would be He was insecure. terribly insecure. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was, there was once a, a, a New Year's Eve party. A friend of mine, he's dead now, a writer by the name of Charles Lederer. I'm sure you heard of him. Mm -hmm. He gave a New Year's Eve party every year, every other year. Everybody came. Small house on Bedford, and there were always hundreds of people in Ryder. Mm -hmm. And among them were also, I mean, every star in town came. Like the old Spiegel parties, but Spiegel had moved to London, mm -hmm. so Lederer took over those big New Year's Eve parties. And uh, there was, uh, every star in Hollywood, and also the, the Shah of Iran was invited to that with his retinue and there. Uh, and uh, I remember dancing on the floor, packed, and there was people, and uh, there comes a word that you're gonna have to bleep out, but uh, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, uh, I, I saw out of the corner of my eye, I saw Betty Bicall dancing with the Shah, and, and uh, mm -hmm. as they were dancing, with was rather small man. Uh, she, uh, he said to her, he says, you dance beautifully. And she says, you bet your ass, Shah. So that I just heard. <laughs> now, now, then, then, uh, suddenly there was a, there was a, a uh, there was a little commotion. And uh, mm. uh, what had happened was that uh, uh, some Canadian uh, Air Force cadets who had been training somewhere mm. in Orange County had, uh, also, they were not invited. This kind of, uh, they just kind of uh, crashed the party. Crashed the party. There they were, and there was one <clears> kid <throat> about uh, I don't know five foot uh, two, and he uh, kind of with acne and, and seeing stars. You know, he was just going from uh, from one star to another, pinching their behinds. You know, just kind of uh, drunk at the elation. Huh? They're, they're all there, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she. Uh, uh, grabbed that kid and he says, she said, Boogie, you know what that guy just did to me? And uh, Boogie got into a, into a little bit and the guy said, oh, shut up, the, the cadet said, the Canadian cadet, and, uh, and slapped Bogart's face. And he says, get the police. And uh, somebody got to the police and he hid in the toilet <laughs> watching. And when the police came and took the cadets out, he opened the door, he was the great hero. Out, out, you sons of bitches, out! So he was yeah. not the great hero then, no? Well, I, I think that speaks well for him. Yeah, I mean, when, he why, defended the honor as, 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 uh, of, of his wife as much as he could. Yes, sir, but, it, it only shows was, uh, what a wonderful actor he He liked was. to incite people. He would put one, he would kind of uh, needle one against the other and watch them fight it out. Mm -hmm. But he himself would not partake in, in anything physical. So it shows he was a supreme actor. On the very good, very, very good. Yeah. You were friends with Peter Lorre, and to yes. me he uh, remains one of the most uh, attractive, it's not really the right word, but compelling figures who's ever been on the screen. Back from the movie M, who yeah. was a child murderer, up through everything he did, it seems. He yes, just, uh, that was, that, was that little, that little uh, ensemble that they had at Warner Brothers. You know, with um, um, the Bogart and uh, Green Street and Laurie and, and the yeah, whole. Yeah, you know. that was the, the thing that was traveling through Morocco, Casablanca, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, with Peter Laurie, great friend of mine from Berlin, yeah. where he met him. And I, when we first came here, and uh, we were desperately trying to learn English, we were just completely shut off. We were staying. We had one room together at the Chateau Marmont, and. Uh, the question was, who is going to get the dime for the can of uh, uh, Campbell tomato uh, soup? You know, we were living like that. But uh, he just uh, was a, uh, he, was a he had that, that uniqueness, you know, that he mm -hmm. had and Stroheim had and, and uh, uh, Sig Ruman had, you know, were actors irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, those, those guys, they will never come again. You know, it is sad to have Garbo not act anymore. Mm -hmm. It's sad to have lost so many great actors and actresses. But one of the saddest, for instance, is my great favorite actor, Claude Rains. When the Rains oh. left, you know, a whole 
slew of pictures could not be made anymore. Mm -hmm. An incredible, incredible right. uh, thing there, you know, just uh, a, 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 a great force. A, a, I mean, he in Casablanca or Mr. Skeffing, no, whatever, uh, or even without seeing his face, the man, the man, uh, 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 the, the, the invisible man. Invisible uh, man. Absolutely super. Did those people realize, do you suppose, how, how beloved they were or how deified they are now by film buffs and... Absolutely. You know, what was, what was uh, not very good in our, in our remembrance gets worse, what was good, uh, kind of to switch for a second to baseball, uh -huh. if you don't mind, and be better, because the, the game may not be rained out. <laughs> uh, uh, this will give you a clue when we're taping this. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. uh, I tell you now, for instance, uh, uh, Koufax, you know, Koufax was a marvelous pitcher, you know, but mm -hmm. in our recollection, and it all was kind of geometrically magnified, he's deified now, you know, yeah, it was a very right. good pitcher, but when he was pitching, and when we knew him, when we talked to him, say, mm -hmm. it was just, you did not know that there was Freud plus Reigns plus Garbo, right? Right. <laughs> That's funny you mentioned, a I remember doing a show with Betty Davis once in which she said, somehow when Claude Reigns died, it just seemed to be the end of an era. For Absolutely, I, I, I didn't hear. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't know she said that. Funny, but, but how how out through it was. And yeah. other actors, if I may, because everybody always talks about the, the, the same ten the top stuff. But the, what was underneath? You know how solid it was. Yeah. Uh, when you were all through with a scene uh, between uh, between uh, Betty uh, 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 Davis and let us say Claude Rains, on came. Uh, uh, George Sanders, you know, they came, really big trumps were played there. Mm -hmm. They were just all tremendous, tremendous actors. That's right. It doesn't seem like that sort of strength and character acting is around. Uh, no. Maybe one or two exceptions and some survivors of that era. Yeah, but, but uh, the, the, the great, the great mm -hmm. uh, 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 supporting actor mm -hmm. now uh, is the star mm -hmm. and owns the company and has a series that goes for five years, you know? He does not want to be a supporting actor anymore. Yeah. <coughs> Billy, you, you've been, <clears throat> certainly been, uh, as, as every career in Hollywood, both up and down. Um, what are the signs that you start to feel around town when, say, uh, you're, let's say you do a, a, a turkey right after Sunset Boulevard? <laughs> um, I don't know if you happened to or if you've ever done a real turkey. No, but, you're incorrect. Uh, it was not one turkey. There were quite a few turkeys. Oh, there was a flock, yeah. was there? Yeah, there was. <laughs> you know how it goes. But uh, when you're, you're, especially when you're established as you are as a legendary director, then what, but what do you start to feel? Do you get a poorer seat at uh, parties or? Um, the, they... the, the policeman at the gate does not smile quite as uh, readily as he, if, uh, if, I, uh, if he was at the preview of some like at Hut, let's say, or the apartment, he's a little bit friendlier. No, it means absolutely nothing to me. It's yeah. just, uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it throws me for a short loop, but then, uh, <laughs> then I, I just uh, gather myself together. Uh, uh, it hurts, naturally, but I just, sure. uh, I just uh, shorten my grip. Uh, I uh, change my stance. I say to myself, maybe I need some contact lenses. But uh, then I play winter ball in, uh, in the Dominican Republic, and back I come again, I hope. Uh, I just, uh, yes. I, I don't give up, you know. I, I, just, I just go on because yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's too late, and I certainly don't want to sit mm -hmm. on benches uh, and feed pigeons. <laughs> there are people who, who will see that the pigeons get something to eat. Uh, you knew F. Scott Fitzgerald, too, which is... F. Scott thing. Fitzgerald was at Paramount when I was a writer. I was uh, then working with uh, my longtime collaborator, Charles Brackett, and he was a friend of uh, uh, of Scott Fitzgerald, who was working on a script at Paramount. And uh, uh, every afternoon we would uh, go down uh, from the fourth floor, which was the top writers. The top writers were on the fourth floor of the writers' building, yeah. and uh, we would go to across the street to a place called Ublatz, and we would have uh, our coffee, and we would talk. That was shortly before he died. What sort of shape was Fitzgerald in in those days? He was uh, pale and uh, and uh, and uh, shaky and uh, distraught. He was mm -hmm. in the typical shape of a Hollywood writer. <laughs> Not any different. No worse, no, no better. No worse. Whenever you see a writer who's got a good sunburn, 
and he's very strong. You know, that's a writer without too much talent. He can jog and lie there on the thing. The other ones are, are bent over over their uh, alley betty trying to squeeze out the scene. You don't get tan from the alley No, you betty. don't. When, anybody, yeah. any picture writer who is tan, forget it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> give, me, give me the pale ones. <laughs> get me four pale writers. Yeah, four pale writers, yes. <laughs> uh, Speaking of drunks, which is an unfortunate and blunt way to put it, um, but I guess true in Fitzgerald's case and Chandler's, Ray, the legendary Raymond Chandler. Yeah. Also, you, what, did you him. collaborate on... Yes, we wrote, uh, we wrote and I directed uh, Double Indemnity, yes. Yeah, yeah, but you collaborated on the script as well. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, we worked the, the, we, uh, the, the script from an original uh, novella by James Cain, Mm -hmm. uh, which he wrote for Liberty Magazine right uh, after Postman <laughs> Overs Rings Twice, mm -hmm. and a rather similar theme. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to work with Kane on it, but Kane uh, was working at Fox on another picture. So yeah. uh, my producer came up with uh, Chandler. He was then up and coming, and I read all of his short stories in Black Mask Magazine and uh, his novels. and. Oh, he was something, I think. Yeah. Marvelous writer, just wonderful, but uh, he was a nut. He was tough. How, was he a stranger man than Eric von Stroheim, who apparently... Oh, yeah, much stranger. Yeah. Von Stroheim, I could curse uh, him in German, you know. I, the, there was a communication, but, uh, but uh, that's the first time that, uh, that, uh, that uh, when I worked with uh, Chandler, that Chandler had been inside the studio. Uh -huh. He lived somewhere in Hollywood, but never been inside the studio, wrote his novels. Right after, you know, first he was stringing tennis rackets for Spalding somewhere in, in San Francisco. But a super writer, just a yeah. wonderful talent, but uh, very difficult. Lady in the Lake is a classic, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, all of them, all of yeah. them. The brush, the balloon, the, yeah. the big sleep, you know, just a wonderful mood. Just a, well, mm -hmm. uh, Hammett and, and, uh, and uh, Chandler and uh, James Cain uh, in that period, my favorites, naturally. Yeah. What about the strange, we read these weird things about von Stroheim's various fetishes and things. A, a, a man of weird slants on things. Uh-huh. Uh, best explained, you know, there's a picture he made. Uh, all of the pictures were just unique, you know. Mm -hmm. They were fascinating. Sometimes, you know, they were just uh, too repellent for its day, you know. I remember yeah. a picture, I think it was Blind Husbands, I think. And here's the opening of the picture. A, uh, an Austrian uh, uh, lieutenant, played by Stroheim, in an elevator. And he had sort of a cape on, and uh, you know, the Austrian uniform. And uh, he's in that elevator, and a gentleman and a, uh, and a lady, beautifully gowned, enter the elevator on the floor. And the guy takes his hat off, and as the ele elevator goes down, he looks at Stroheim, and finally says, don't you know better than not to take your hat off and a lady is present? And he slaps his face. And Stroheim just stares at him. Elevator arrives downstairs. The lady and the gentleman walk out. And Stro as Stroheim gets out of the elevator, the cape sort of opens a little. And you see he's got no arms. Mm. That's just for openness, you know? <laughs> a, a kind of, ooh. That's huh? the first laugh. Yeah, well, that's that's the kind of uh, mind that he had. Wow. But uh, he he was kind of a a, a man uh, possessed, and uh, yeah. in many respects a genius, but then ultimately uh, so expensive, uh, so uh, 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 such a perfectionist, or trying to uh, do so many things for which the audience in those days certainly was not ready, mm -hmm. that uh, he was let go. Ah, but uh, when he, when he, I made a picture with him, I remember, in the early 40s, Five Graves to Cairo, where, oh, where, yes, yeah, yeah, where, oh, where uh, Stroheim played uh, uh, General Rommel. Yeah. And I was a great admirer of his, but I had never met him. Uh, he had arrived from Paris for that part. And uh, I was shooting in India, I was shooting some tank stuff, and I, I came back to the studio and told me, Stroheim has arrived and he's now at Western costume being uh, uh, outfitted in his uniform, you know, the, the Desert Fox, you know, yeah. Rommel. And I run up to Western costume around the corner from Paramount, right on, on Melrose here. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I see him there and I click my heels and I said, uh, have on Stroheim, I mean, this is just, uh, 
what a marvelous moment to meet you and, and what a tremendous honor, you know, that little I should now be directing uh, the great Stroheim. And he just stared at me and to make him feel at ease, he says, your problem was that you, was, was that you were 10 years ahead of your time. And he looked at me and said, 20? But that, that, was, that was Stroheim, you know. That was your meeting. Yeah, that, that was that was Stroheim. Or then we would, have, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry too. That at this point I, we have, uh, or to put it bluntly, run out of tape for the moment, and um, so we, we shall uh, have to uh, say goodbye temporarily. I hope you it's only. To, you want me to get the help? I hope it's only temporarily. <laughs> we were out of tape, and Billy Wilder was out of time. He said that he would come again, and I certainly intend to ask him. Thank you, Billy Wilder. Good night.